This evening's lecture is titled Plastic Pete, Mondrian's Life in Shapes. And that is a very deliberate choice because I think we can look at the life and work of one of the most straightforward, yet at the same time, almost impenetrably complex artists through the shapes that he produced and those that produced him. Mondrian's life was plastic. He was malleable to change in his work and life. Mondrian was also an agent of change. Plastic too, because he reversed the shape of life. Mondrian's revolution was no flash of youthful, youthful zeal setting to maturing conservatism. In fact, his journey went in reverse. From youthful conservatism to middle-aged revolt. The first 29 of his 71 years were in the Victorian era. It wasn't until he was in his 40s that he reshaped himself piece by piece from near unknown Dutch landscape artist to the high priest of abstraction. He once wrote, the elements of form have a particular aspect. Every fragment, every plane, every line has its proper character. This evening, we will also look at the shapes in the Mondrian story, the cross, the tree, ovals, lozenges, the letter A, and the shape of his homeland, the Netherlands. Mondrian tried to shape, compose his own public perception as well as his art. He wanted to fashion his public image as an ascetic monk, but he could play the party animal with a love of jazz and dancing. Composition is the hallmark of Mondrian's classic works, the positioning of colors and shapes. The composition of his life is equally fascinating. Peter Cornelis Mondrian was born on the 7th of March, 1872 in Amersfoort in the Netherlands into a family shaped both by art and strict Calvinist Christianity. His father, Peter Cornelius Mondrian Sr. was head of a primary school and variously described as draftsman and qualified drawing teacher. His uncle, Frederick Hendrik Fritz Mondrian, was a painter and a pupil of Willem Maris of the Hague School of Artists. Peter Mondrian Sr. taught his son to draw at a young age and they would produce, produce devotional lithographs together. Mondrian Jr. painted religious illustrations for the Gear Formerde Kirk, which had a radical Protestant congregation. At this time, he was a firm believer in traditional art and was opposed to modernism. His early work was produced to sell rather than for developing his own style. He made a series of religious illustrations based on 17th century examples, such as Peter Panis beheaded in Mechelen and Peter Panis on the gallows in Mechelen. In 1892, Mondrian, already a qualified teacher, entered the Rijks Academy, the Academy for Fine Art in Amsterdam. Most of his work from this period is naturalistic or impressionistic, consisting largely of landscapes, windmills, fields and rivers, initially in the Dutch impressionist style of the Hague School. In December of that year, an exhibition of paintings by Vincent van Gogh moved to Amsterdam and Mondrian went to see it. The work had a profound effect on him. He slowly began incorporating the new ideas he had seen. Van Gogh's Starry Night of 1889 can be seen as a direct influence on Mondrian in later works, such as the 1908 Night Landscape One. The move to the Rijks Academy and exposure to Van Gogh saw Mondrian's work change dramatically. He integrated the bold color and brushwork of Van Gogh the post-impressionists and the pointillist technique of Georges Seurat, as seen in A Sunday on La Grande Jatte. In 1900, Mondrian became interested in theosophy, 
a mystical belief system based on humanity's evolution towards spiritual unity. Theosophy seeks divine wisdom. Categorized by scholars of religion as both a new religious movement and as part of the occultist stream of Western esotericism, it draws upon both older European philosophies, such as Neoplatonism, and Asian religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism. Theosophical organizations regard it as a system that embraces the essential truth underlying religion, philosophy, and science. As a result, theosophical groups allow their members to hold other religious allegiances, resulting in theosophists who also identify as Christians, Buddhists, or Hindus. Applied to art, and it is a belief Mondrian subscribed to, theosophy held that vertical elements, such as trees, were masculine, and the horizontal, such as the sea, were feminine. For Mondrian, balancing the vertical and horizontal became critical. It can be argued that Mondrian the artist could not have developed as he did without being raised in the Netherlands, not just as an inheritor of Rembrandt, Van Gogh and the Dutch landscape tradition of painting, but in the very plasticity of the geographical form of the Netherlands. Since the 14th century, the Dutch have been reclaiming land from dike building and the development of windmills for pumping water in the 15th century, the Netherlands has been expanding. At the time of Mondrian's final transition to abstraction in 1918, the Zyder Zee works, a man-made system of dams and dikes, land reclamation and water drainage work were beginning. It was the largest hydraulic engineering project undertaken by the Netherlands during the 20th century. Although he is best known for his abstract paintings made from lines, squares and rectangles, Mondrian started out painting realistic scenes and followed easily in the Dutch landscape tradition. Early in his career, he was more interested in selling rather than developing an individual style. He supported himself by giving private drawing lessons in his studio, selling copies of museum paintings and producing scientific drawings. In fact, Mondrian was the assistant to Reindart Peter van Kalker, a professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands. The research focused on cholera and Mondrian drew bacteriological specimens for the laboratory. Between 1901 and 1920, the scientists working on this research were awarded three Nobel Prizes. We can see his landscape work in the 1902-3 truncated view of the Brookhidzida Mollen on the Gein, an oil on canvas mounted on cardboard. The 1903 Oostzijder mill along the river along the river Gein by moonlight and and the 1905-6 line of trees in marshy landscape near Divendrecht, chalk and watercolour painting on paper, and the 1907 mill in Het Gein. At this stage, Mondrian's style remains clearly representational of real life scenes. But in the truncated view, of the Brookside Mollen on the Gein, we can find an early example of Mondrian subverting the shape of traditional Dutch landscape painting, bringing us in so close, almost as if with the aid of a modern day zoom slider into the bridge and mill pond. We, we also find another familiar shape in Mondrian's earlier works, the windmill. Later adaptations would highlight his development being Mill in Sunlight, the Winkel Mill of 1908, which strips the naturalistic from the scene and it throbs with powerful, vivid primary colours. 
The Red Mill of 1911 presents us with clear, simple outlines and colour to give the painting a sense of monumentality. This simplicity of colour and shape would be taken to an extreme by Mondrian within a decade. Mondrian made the move to Paris in 1912, and it was a career changing one. It brought him under the influence of Cubism and into the thriving center of the avant-garde art world. Twice before he moved to Paris, he disappointed women, Agatha Zetraeus and Greta Haybrook, who had expected his hand in marriage. He thought domesticity would force him into the restricted life of an artist who worked to pay the bills rather than one who worked to find his pure style. Committed to his commitment to his art was all. This was a man who threatened in 1926 never to return to his homeland because the Netherlands had banned the Charleston. Mondrian explored the techniques of artists like Georges Sura and Paul Cezanne and began the process of breaking away from pure representational painting. He was exposed to the work of Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque particularly, and the shift from a representational neo-impressionistic style to modern abstractions, as can be seen in Braque's 1909 work, Houses and Trees, and Picasso's Standing Female Nude of 1910. Cubism would provide Mondrian with a structure into which he could distill his landscapes into the sparest elements of line and shape, as we will see later. He made use of the cubist grid, reducing his images of trees and buildings to a schematized framework. However, unlike the cubists, Mondrian wished to stress the flatness of the painting surface rather than allude to three dimensional illusionistic depth as the cubist depicted. Flatness would become a defining characteristic of his work. When Mondrian moved to Paris, he was required to register his identity with the local police prefecture. Upon submitting the form to establish his identity, the officer on duty laughed scornfully as he addressed him P. et Mondrian. The Dutch pronunciation was Piet Mondrian. So he changed his name from the Dutch Mondrian of two A's to the Parisian Mondrian of one A. It was symbolic of the changes he would make in his life and work. From that day on, his public name changed to Mondrian with a single A, and on paintings, Piet became P. In time, he would scale it back further, simply signing Mondrian. Again, it would mirror his artistic shift. Mondrian's fascination with trees and their shape developed out of his earlier landscape painting. Trees enabled him to address the balance of the vertical and horizontal. After settling in Paris, and absorbing the influence of Cubism, Mondrian reworked his trees almost to total abstraction. The trunk and branches would become condensed to a network of verticals and horizontals, as we will see shortly. He acknowledged the inspiration of nature, excuse me, he acknowledged the inspiration of nature, but added, I want to come as close as possible to the truth and abstract everything from that until I reach the foundation of things. During this period, with the influence of Van Gogh and the Cubists upon him, it is evident that Mondrian is experimenting with style, but he had yet to develop one that was clearly his own. We can see this experimentation in a series of his tree paintings. From the Willow Grove impression of light and shadow of 1905 and Spring Sun Castle Ruin, which we saw on the previous slide, through to the red hot and cold blue of the 1908-1910 Evening Red Tree and the 1911 Grey Tree. 
with its evident cubist style. But Mondrian goes further and the trees become more non-objective. Trees 1912, the 1912-13 composition Trees 2, and the Tree A of 1913. Here I think we can see in these works the impact of Picasso's standing female nude of 1910, and we are made to work harder as an observer to detect the natural form. It's a question not of being unable to see the wood for the trees, but of trying to find the tree in a wood of shapes. We also get an early taste of his later use of the word composition in a title in the 1912-13 composition Trees 2. The paring down of his titles would become commonplace in his abstract works as those were themselves. De Steele. In 1914, Mondrian returned to the Netherlands to visit his sick father. While he was there, World War I broke out and he was unable to return to Paris until 1919. The Netherlands remained neutral throughout the war and Mondrian, although isolated from avant-garde Paris, was able to continue his work as an artist relatively unhindered, spending the majority of the war in Lorraine, an artist colony. He was a contributor to the De Steele art movement and group, which he co-founded with Theo van Duisburg. De Steele, was also the name of the journal published by Van Duisburg. The Steel or the Style was a movement that sought an ideal of total abstraction as a model for harmony and order across the arts. They de developed a vision of modernism independently from that found in Paris. It was around this time that Mondrian coined the term neoplasticism. Neoplasticism essentially means new art. Painting and sculpture were plastic arts that could be molded and shaped. The De Steele circle of artists adopted it, at least up until Mondrian's secession from the group in 1923, after he had fallen out with Van Duisburg. One of Mondrian's best expressions of his theory of art came from a letter he wrote to H.P. Bremer in 1914. He said, I construct lines and colour combinations on a flat surface in order to express general beauty with the utmost awareness. Nature, or that which I see, inspires me, puts me, as with any painter, in an emotional state so that an urge comes about to make something but I want to make but I want to come as close as possible to the truth and abstract everything from that until I reach the foundation still just an external foundation of things I believe it is possible that through horizontal and vertical lines constructed with awareness but not with calculation led by high intuition and brought to harmony and rhythm these basic forms of beauty, supplemented if necessary by other direct lines or curves, can become a work of art, as strong as it is true. At this point, Mondrian hadn't yet shed the curve. He would say, curves are so emotional. But to make the final leap to a fully geometric, non-representational art, he went through an oval phase, which in a perverse way begins with a rectangle. Through the 1914 composition eight and tableau three composition in oval and composition 1916, we see the geometric shapes with which he would soon become identified becoming clearer within the canvases. In Mondrian's 1915 composition number 10, Pier and Ocean, we see color removed and the imposition of clear, free-floating, horizontal and vertical lines, some forming into crosses. 
Ovals were important in theosophy because it was believed they signified original cosmic energy. Historians rarely need much motivation to draw parallels between past and present. So it is fitting that we should be able to draw a pandemic into the Mondrian story, not COVID-19, but one that killed millions a century ago. In 1918, Mondrian contracted the deadly Spanish flu. The symptoms continued for months, confining Mondrian to his studio, where he found solace in painting and art. I suspect lockdown and self-isolation were less restrictive for Mondrian than they are for us a century later. By 1917-19, Mondrian's work was becoming increasingly geometric. Mondrian's 1917 composition with colour fields and composition in colour A edges towards the style that would soon become his own. The colours are softer while the black lines appear and disappear. Mondrian's 1919 composition checkerboard gives us some of the colour and some of the shapes, but we lose the black lines and white planes. Excuse me, let me go back. Right. In the lozenges compositions of 1918-19, including the 19 comp 1919 composition light colour planes with grey lines, we see the final hallmarks of his style starting to show, the thick black vertical and diagonal lines framing the coloured planes in the canvas tilted 45 degrees. Mondrian will return to lozenges periodically through the rest of his career, including his final unfinished work in 1944. In 1919, Mondrian returned to Paris. He found Parisian art had stagnated during World War I, with Mondrian ahead of the prevailing mood. He wrote at the time, I believe that new art must differ totally in its manifestation from art as we know it, and people may be very reluctant to accept this. It is perhaps true to say, as someone did of Cubism, that to sum up, since art is a need to create rather than imitate, the Cubists rousing themselves from the sentimentality born of the picturesque aspect of some natural spectacle or other, disengage the fleeting aspects from those which are constant and absolute, and with the aid of these two elements, construct a reality equivalent to that which we see before them, or what they see before them. We can certainly see as we go through Mondrian's work, the lines and shapes present constancy and absolutism. He went on, thus it is a question of finding the true equivalence. That offered by Cubism is still not true equivalence, and this can only be that which is not nature at all, and is nonetheless one with nature. But he was depressed and considered giving up art as his radical development had alienated patrons, a situation only relieved when his friend and buyer, Solomon B. Sliper, found new clients. From his time in Paris, Mondrian extended his compositional practices into his studio. There is a clear sense of the relationship between architectural space and Mondrian's use of primary colors and straight lines. It also illustrates how Mondrian's canvases were in constant dialogue with their surroundings. While Mondrian experienced enforced moves, he transformed each new studio blurring the boundary between art and his life. His walls became his proving ground. He constantly altered the compositions of the colored planes displayed on his walls as if they were on the canvas. Walls and, furnitures and furniture were wa whitewashed in stark white. Rectangles of cardboard painted in primary colors were gridded on all four walls. 
He painted his DIY fruit crate furniture bright white to immerse his whole life in his current artistic direction. By the mid 1920s, his studio contained a phonograph and he played jazz records to paint and dance by. His studios have often been recreated, including the Tate exhibition, which included a life-size reconstruction of Mondrian's most famous studio in the Montparnasse district of Paris, which he occupied from 1921 to 36. This year is the 100th anniversary of what we might regard as the first true canonical Mondrian. It is the first time that he puts all the elements together, black horizontal and vertical lines, the white and primary color planes framed within in one piece of work. Composition A shows this moment of maturity. It is worth stopping for a moment to note that Mondrian did not use a ruler to measure or draw his lines. He thought carefully about where to place them and executed the work by hand and eye alone. It is a testament to his precision, precision as an artist. And it's really only when you get really close up to his work that you see that they aren't ruler based. And neither were the white planes blank unpainted patches of canvas. Meticulously, Mondrian painted the white planes layer by layer. When Mondrian painted, he would always mix his own colors, never using the paint directly out of a tube. Adhering to his theosophic principles, Mondrian continued to work to simplify the elements in his paintings, seeking the purest forms of line and color. But composition A can still be seen as lacking something in balance, the equilibrium Mondrian sought, and also in motion. This desire is evidenced in his work throughout the 1920s, as the white planes increase in size, the color planes diminish in size and prominence, but from the edges, they give the paintings a dynamic sense of clockwork motion. Notice how this motion is accentuated by not extending all the black lines to the edge of the canvas as if they were working cogs in the machine. This change can be seen through the 1921 composition in red, yellow, blue and black. Composition with blue, red, yellow and black of 1922 and the 1925 tableau number eight. We also see it in the 1927 composition number three with red, yellow and blue and composition with red, yellow and blue in 1928. And Mondrian, and Mondrian continued to simplify continued to reduce line and color. Lozenge composition with two lines from 1931 and Lozenge composition with yellow lines from 1933 illustrate just how far he had deconstructed his work. And this is particularly evident when we compare it to his 1921 work lozenge composition with yellow, black, red, blue, and gray. But from these starkest non-representational pure forms, Mondrian would introduce the double black line or tram line at the age of 60 in 1932 to foster an optical feeling of movement, a development illustrated in composition with blue and red. And from this step, the grid would follow. The 1930s would see significant changes in Mondrian's life and work. In the mid to late 30s, the grid of Europe was changing as Nazi Germany undermined the post-war international order. Germany withdrew from the League of Nations in 1933 
rebuilt German armed, re armed forces reoccupied the Rhineland in 1936, annexed Austria in 1938, and invaded the whole of Czechoslovakia in 1939. When Germany invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, Great Britain and France declared war on Germany. In July 1937, Mondrian's paintings had been included in Nazi Germany's Degenerate Art Exhibition. The exhibition contained 650 artworks that had been confiscated from museums across Germany. Artworks and paintings which undermined religion were created by Jewish artists, criticized Germany or Germans or the regime, or were simply modern or abstract were featured in the collection. An official counter exhibition was organized called the Greater German Art Exhibition, but it attracted only half the number of visitors as the Degenerate Art Exhibition did. Mondrian and many other artists felt the writing literally was on the wall and they left continental Europe. In September 1938, Mondrian left Paris and moved to London. With the help of artists Norm Garbo and Ben Nicholson, he was quickly settled into a Hampstead flat, receiving gifts of furniture and clothes, including a much appreciated pair of slippers from Garbo. He soon transformed his living space into a Mondrian style space, painting over the brown walls and minimal furniture in a brilliant white with the odd patch of red, as if creating a 3D version of his own paintings. But after the Netherlands was invaded and Paris fell in 1940, he left a London in which the house that he had lived had been bombed for Manhattan in New York City, where he would remain until his death. On the 23rd of September, 1940, Mondrian left Europe for New York aboard the Cunard White Star Lines ship RMS Samaria, departing from Liverpool. In work resumed on the other side of the Atlantic, we see the tram lines have expanded into a grid as illustrated in Composition with Blue, Red and Yellow, 1935 to 42. The 1938-39 Composition Number no. 1 with Grey and Red and the 1940-42 composition number 11 with blue, red and yellow. But these were essentially extensions of the double tram lines and compositions. In New York, where he could really indulge his love of music, particularly jazz music and dancing, his work seemed to pick up a furious intensity as the grids left the straight jacket of their black lines. Through New York City of 1942, we see the vibrancy of a lattice work in the primary colors. However, we also see a first as Mondrian layered his lines, giving his work a rare feeling of depth as the lines sometimes obviously, sometimes less obviously, overlay and underlay each other. In the 1942-44 New York City 2, Mondrian began to use tape not as a guide to producing a straight line, but to position and reposition almost endlessly his lines. In 1943, he wrote, only now I become conscious that my work in black, white and little color planes has merely been drawing in oil color. In drawing, the lines are the principal means of expression. In painting, however, the lines are absorbed by the colour planes, but the limitations of the planes show themselves as lines and conserve their great value. But a greater development came when he returned to his traditional flat approach, although as we can see, to label it traditional in any sense would be a distinct misnomer. Stylistically, he positions the squares to present the overlaps we see in his New York City paintings. For Broadway Boogie Woogie, 
of 1943 is staggeringly vibrant and innovative, even by Mondrian's standards, as he reached his 70th birthday, it is a full-on assault of pulsating primary colours. Although Mondrian had long ago shed a suggestion of direct representational work, in Broadway Boogie Woogie, you could be looking down from a Manhattan skyscraper at the bustle, lights and cars of the New York streets to an American jazz soundtrack. Mondrian had found a true home in New York, describing his time there as the happiest of his life, surrounded by jazz, dancing and becoming part of the burgeoning New York avant-garde art scene. He joined the American abstract artists, adding legit legitimacy to the new group's role in modern art through his mentorship in European abstraction. In the last 18 months of his life, Mondrian returned to the lozenge. The unfinished Victory Boogie Woogie, we presume Victory is a reference to the expected conclusion of World War mm. II, was worked upon feverishly, both in health and intent, until the day he was admitted to hospital with pneumonia in late January 1944, adding, moving, removing tape as if he sensed he had a minute or a breath to waste. Pete Mondrian died on the 1st of February 1944, aged 71, and was interred at the Cypress Hills Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. Mm. Mondrian's immense impact on the development of modern art survived his death. Mondrian's style can be seen in the developments of the minimalists of the late 1960s. Professor Susan Dyker of the University of, University of Wismar suggests it could be claimed Mondrian discovered Jackson Pollock, whose work he certainly advocated. Mark Rothko called Mondrian the most sensual artist he knew, speaking of his use of colour, and Roy Lichtenstein was undoubtedly influenced by Mondrian. But in terms of popular culture, Yves Saint Laurent's Mondrian dresses, building on Michel Souffer's book on the artist, probably brought the Dutchman more recognition than any number of exhibitions would have done. Souffer had associated at various points with Theo van Duisburg and Mondrian, and was influenced by their neo by their neoplasticist works. Souffor was a founder of the abstract artist group Circle Ecare, which included Vasily Kandinsky and Le Corbusier. Aside from prints of his work, you can live the Mondrian lifestyle from a range of homeware to dresses, t-shirts, nail varnish, and shoes. What Mondrian would have thought of the commercialization of his pure spiritually inspired abstract art is open to conjecture. But what is certain is that Mondrian altered the shape of his own life from comfortable landscape artist to the pioneer of abstract art. He also changed the shape of art and where subsequent artists could go in their own work. His work, his studio have their afterlife. And I think in this Mondrian would have found spiritual satisfaction. Mm. Yeah, thank 